good afternoon professor good afternoon good afternoon yes sir welcome sir welcome to our fpt program yes sir yes sir yes sir thank you sir thanks god yes professor can we start the session professor yes 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 please yes nirmal yes. sir please take a lead professor yes sir thank you sir thank you sir honorable vice chancellor madam a respected registrar and all the participants as well as my dear colleagues we are very good afternoon to one and all present here it is my immense pleasure to invite our today's resource person professor dr n abhinesh joseph to deliver the talk on the modern concept of rule of law in administrative jurisprudence before handing over the session to professor dr v um, ebenezer joseph a small introduction about sir professor dr ebenezer joseph is the retired principal of government law college tirunelveli he has been graduated in law from sri venkateswara university tirupati he did his masters from the university of kerala and phd from tamil nadu dr ambedkar law university sir has joined tamil nadu legal studies in 1988 and continued till 2014 thereafter he was the head of the department of the department of intellectual property at the tamil nadu dr ambedkar law university chennai he is instrumental in starting the department of law of taxation therein so he became the head of the department of the department of taxation as well he presented various papers in national and international uh, seminars sir has also organized a national level seminar while he was the principal of government law college tirunelveli he is also the resource person in various institution across the country sir has joined tamil nadu national law university as a visiting faculty in the year 2020 21 his area of interest includes direct and indirect taxation as well as the intellectual property rights so with this small introduction now i hand over the session to professor dr ebenezer joseph over to you sir thanks uh, mr hira it's audible yes sir yes sir now you are audible okay yes you are professor honorable uh, vice chancellor uh, my dear colleagues faculty members and a very pleasant uh, good afternoon to all of you i thank uh, honorable vice chancellor and the professor nirmal singh hira for having given me this opportunity of uh, uh, in the faculty development program about uh, rule of law and its uh, implications in administrative law and uh, uh, thank you for the brief introduction given to me and also i apologize myself for the late uh, response due to this uh, internet connection i have i believe that all the participants would uh, uh, concentrate on this uh, little uh, discussion about the concept of rule of law but i believe that all of you may be so familiar about the rule of law and uh, all the law students or the scholars we come across uh, the rule of law it is uh, uh, we that it has been actually evolved by we dicey now this uh, as far as rule of law is concerned just i shall try to discuss what exactly we mean by rule of law and uh, what is the implication of rule of law in india as well as uh, the impact of rule of law in administrative law and thereafter i shall discuss modern aspects regarding rule of law and as far as rule of law is concerned the important point is rule of law it is a concept or rule of law it is an ideal it is a concept or some ideal just like a human rights democracy or federalism and simply we cannot mean that rule of law means we are ruled by law when we are ruled by law we call that rule by law when we are governed by a particular specific law we say that a rule of law suppose a lawyer is to apply uh, facts of the case with the specific relief fact or transfer of property or contract act and at that time we can say that a rule of law now we have to be governed by or the rule of uh, law governs us 
that time we can say that we are governed by the rule by law. Whereas when we say rule of law, it is a, a concept or it is a principle or it is an idea that is to be uh, enshrined or that is to be incorporated in many of the uh, legal systems. This is the important about uh, rule of law. So that's why rule of law, it is a concept just like a federalism or just like a democracy, we can say that. Now, actually, when we say that uh, the rule of law, the idea is, uh, see, uh, we can say that uh, though we are living the state of nature, or uh, though we are uh, uh, living a, a totally controlled by nature, we can say that uh, even nature has got its own limitation. Nature has got its own control. And we study that, suppose Earth, Earth revolves itself uh, uh, every day. But also, for uh, 365 days, Earth revolves around the Sun. It's 365 days like we study. So, Earth has got its own orbit, or it has got its own path. And it cannot deviate from its path, or it is controlled by its path, controlled by its orbit, and Earth cannot rotate arbitrarily, or Earth cannot rotate its own wish, uh, wishes. And just like that, you take the case of your bird. When you take the bird, it can fly, but a bird, it cannot swim. You take the case of your fish, fish cannot fly, but a fish can swim. So just like that, uh, nature, even though freedom is there, even though we are having the liberty and everything is there, still nature controls everything. Nature gives. Is it not audible? You are audible, sir. Audible, audible only, professor. We are hearing you. Okay. Please, professor. Nature has got its own limitation. So beyond that limitation, we cannot function. And whether it is a fish, bird, human being, whoever may be, if heart beats for 72 times a minute means, it is a system that is available uh, it is with each and every human being. And like that, we are controlled, even though we are in nature, it is not arbitrary. It is not arbitrary and we are being controlled. And thereby, they see limit. A limit is there. Beyond that, we cannot uh, go. And just like that, when we come across the legal system also, in one way or another, our behavior or our contact is uh, controlled in one way or another. And for the purpose of controlling this, or for the purpose of limiting this, our wisdom or our conscience or some sort of thinking it is common to each and everybody may be controlling us or it may be uh, uh, it may be putting us in a particular limit and beyond which we cannot travel this is uh, one idea regarding nature and the restriction that is uh, laid down by law we can say that. now as far as this rule of law is concerned the thing is in rule of law also there is a limit or there is a and beyond that limit, beyond that control, we cannot go. And that's how we can say that the concept of rule of law might have evolved in the society. And as far as evolution of law is concerned, when you study historical jurisprudence scholar or uh, historical jurisprudence scholar, that is Henry Maine. And Henry Maine, in his text on ancient law, he classifies the evolution of law into three aspects. The first one is the period of mistress. The second one is the period of custom. And the third one is what we call as the period of codified law. And as far as the period of mistress is concerned, Henry Main says that period of mistress means it is the period of the goddess of justice. Now, Henry Main, he gives his own theory regarding the evolution of law based on the period of mistress. Now, just imagine in ancient society, 
where there was no law at all, a lawless society, the ancient society. But in that society, there are two persons called the A and B. Now, just imagine A and B are there in the society. No law is there. There is a dispute between A and B. And with regard to that dispute, A and B are fighting with each other. Now, fighting doesn't come to any end. And what happens is, this A and B goes to a person, say C. And they tell their problem or put their problem before C. And C says that, uh, okay, you come tomorrow, I shall give you a solution for your problem. Then next day, A and B comes to C for the solution of their problem. C says that, I shall give you a solution for your problem. And uh, this problem, this solution is not given by me. Solution is given by goddess of justice. Yesterday, I was sleeping, thinking over your problem. And in my dream, goddess of justice came. And the goddess of justice asked me, what is your problem? I put forth the problem to the goddess of justice. The goddess of justice gave a solution to the problem. And the solution I am giving you in a cattle. For the purpose of enforcing his decision, he put the burden on goddess of justice and he gave the decision to A and B. And A and B they agreed with the decision and they followed the decision or the solution given by C. And the next day, a similar problem arose in between B and E. When the similar problem arose in between B and E, and B and E, again they went to C of solving their problem. And when B and E went to uh, C to solve their problem, the similar problem place in between A and C. C, I, A and B. C was telling you tomorrow, let me ask the goddess of justice for, your, for solving your problem, for giving a solution to your problem. And C was thinking, if I give a different solution other than solution what to A and B, e, B and E will not trust me. Thus, similar problem, similar solution must be given like that C was thinking. So next day when D and E came and uh, C, the leader, he gave the same solution given to A and B for the similar problem. And in the next day, again, similar problem rose in between F and G. F and G came to the judge and uh, C, the judge, he gave the similar solution. At last, when the problem comes to X and Z or X and Y asked, X and Y would not go to the judge C because X and Y would know that if we go to the C, if we go to judge, he would give only similar solution given to A and B, solution given to D and E, solution given to E and B. Like that, they would not go to the judge they would themselves they would know the decision so henry main says that this is the origin of law or this is the evolution of the law when same decision is our similar decision is given to similar problems uh, asked people would know what would be the solution for a particular problem and thereby need not go to the judge in order to understand or in order to solve their problem that means it is the period of evolution of custom or evolution of customary practices or evolution or of some rules and regulations it is applicable to all the people so once such type of decisions are given once such types of solutions are given once people know that such type of solutions or such types of remedies are available and they are controlled or they are limited by particular uh, i mean solution suppose there is a in between a and b there is a question regarding prohibited relationship 
C solves the problem. And then the X, Y, whoever may be, they come across the same thing about the prohibited relationship. And thereafter, they would not go beyond that. They would not think beyond that. This is how we can say that law evolved in a society in one way or another it controlled everybody it controls each and everybody but one of the basic question is whether such law evolved such a thing evolved and controlled the thing also or were controlled only ordinary people so that is the basic question that evolved suppose i give the example of prohibited relationship and a prohibited relationship whether is applicable only to common man or suppose a king he wants to marry a girl whether the concept of prohibited relationship would apply so in the sense whether the king is beyond the norms laid down in the society or the king is also subject to the norms laid down by the society when that question arose in ancient society you may be knowing that the king can do no wrong or king is above the law and like that the concept was there and thereby even though the legal system was developed even though there is a question of legality even though there is a system of control in the society one of the best questions that arose from the control is whether everybody is subject controlled laid down in the society or there are certain privileges or there are certain exceptions and as far as this concept is concerned as already i have told you there is a, the ancient society the exception was there as far as the kings were concerned the kings they were above the law or the kings they were not controlled by the law like that a system was there we know that thereby we studied the king is the i mean the king can do no wrong or the king cannot be brought within the control of law like the system was there so this is the basic problem existing in the society whether king can be brought with control or not now as far as uh, this position is concerned the rule of law we can say that it is a concept has been evolved in order to bring everybody within the control of uh, the, i mean law governed in a particular society so that's why we see about the rule of law concept of rule of law the basic or the very important concept regarding rule of law is uh, rule of law is to bring or rule of law to test to control each and everybody including the king within the preview of view of law so that's why there are two concepts one is the parliament stands in between subjects and the king and the another important concept is the administrative law officially the judicial review stands in between the subjects and the king so i have told you that in one side the king or the state and the another side subjects are in the uh, the people governed by the king so now if any dispute arose in between the individual and the individual or if any dispute arose in between one individual and one of the subjects and other subjects of the state then there is a lot to control them and now the question is when a dispute arose between the subject and the king or when a dispute arose between the subject and the state how to control that or how to control because the principle is that king can do no wrong and in the sense we know that from the king we have inherited state so state can uh, cannot do no wrong like the concept is there so what i would like to say is if there is a dispute between the individual and the individual law controls but the question is if there is a dispute between individual and the state or if there is a dispute between individual and the king how to control or how to control uh, bring king within the preview of law these are the questions that evolved uh, in, in the most of the societies 
that's why if you see uh, uh, that so many of the instances we can come across at a slow base slowly or stage by stage the king has been part in the purview of uh, what we call as uh, purview of law or the king cannot go beyond the law the theory has been involved this is the importance of this uh, concept of rule of law so the simply speaking as far as the concept of rule of law is concerned uh, the concept of rule of law the idea is uh, the king or the individual are to be not within the purview of law now as far as the king is concerned it, the, the thing is as far as king is concerned he is the sole authority of law he is the sole depository of law he is supposed to govern the people and since the king is to give the law to the people i mean since the king is to govern the people the king cannot be uh, uh, king himself he cannot be controlled by anybody and at that time in england parliamentary system developed and in the parliamentary system parliament it starts to control the king parliament says that the king if at all you control the people at that time you have to follow the law that is laid down by the parliament you cannot go beyond the law laid down by the parliament like that parliament started to control the king so the parliament by way of legislation started to I take away the powers of the king and just like that this about uh, as a legal development and just like that when any dispute arose in between the king and the state at that time the judiciary also it started to the king the judiciary when any matter is brought before the judiciary it is uh, in the common law court in england the judiciary also started to the king stating that uh, one by one stating that uh, the king not go beyond the law or king is to obey the law like that. one by one he started to control the king as far as uh, uh, in one side the parliament was controlling the king and another side as far as the individual and the subjects are concerned the judiciary it started to control the king and in that way what happened was in 1215 ad uh, i mean uh, uh, there was a king called the king john and uh, the barons or the common people in england they agitated against the king john and they got an assurance from king john that their property or liberty can be taken away only by the, uh, i mean only through the law or only by law like that they got an assurance from uh, the king john this is what we call as the great charter of the magna carta the, the important point is the point what i would like to see, see is if at all the king wants to take away liberty of the people at any moment arbitrarily he could take away the liberty of the people if at all the king wanted to wants to take away property of the people arbitrarily he can take away the property of the people without any norms or without any guidelines so the simple point is suppose we take the case of property now the property in between two individuals a and b are there and a wants to take the property b now a will buy the property or b is to give the property or some sort of transfer is to take place as far as in between a and b that is two private individuals now the king wants to take away the property of an individual if the king wants to take away property of the individual whether the king is to buy the property or whether the king is to get the property by, of, by way of gift or the king is to i mean take away the property or the king is to uh, uh, what we uh, what can we say without any norms or without any guidelines king can arbitrarily take away the property this is the question suppose you imagine that government of india government of india wants wants to take away 
property to a particular individual. Now, whether the government of India at the time of taking away the property is to follow principles or guidelines given in the Transfer of Property Act, or the government of India at the time of taking away the property can take away the property arbitrarily. So, government of India represents the king, so thereby king can do no wrong. Our king is the founder of justice, so whether the king can take away the property arbitrarily. Or suppose you take the case of liberty. There is a liberty or something freedom in between and a two persons that, that is controlled by law. Suppose if state wants to take away my liberty, whether the state can take away my liberty arbitrarily, this is the question. So that's why the property of the state, whether the state can take away my property. So or it is to bound by law. That is the question. So that's why at that time also the same thing was existing and thereby in the Agnakarta or the Great Charter, the people got an assurance from the king that if at all their property or the liberty can be taken away, king can be taken away their property or the liberty only in accordance with the law or only by following the principles of law. Suppose if there was a law the transfer of property was existing at that time. If at all the king wanted to take away the property, the king was to supposed to follow the principles of given in the or the law given by transfer of property act, and the king cannot go beyond the transfer of property act. So that's why what I would like to impress is that thing the king was not following the law, the king was not acting arbitrarily, and thereby. Against that, uh, what we call as uh, the system was developed, and just like that, that is the basic origin regarding the concept of rule of law. So, uh, under the uh, I mean concept of rule of law, Magna Carta, the uh, Magna, the Great Charter, it brought king in the view of law. It brought king in the uh, uh, I mean uh, in the boundary of law. And king cannot go beyond the law in the sense king is supposed to follow the law. So in the ancient law, we see that law was developed by way of some sort of solutions given by the judges. And once the solutions are given, a binding nature or limitation is put forth, and whoever may be, whether the individual or the state, are supposed to be within that limitation. This is the basic idea of rule of law. So in Henry main period, ancient law, law developed. So, but the only question is whether law developed brings king also or the state also within its purview. And that failed. Now in 2015 AD, we can say that they are bringing the king also or the state also within the purview of law. Or the within the preview of the rules, uh, the norms laid down by king cannot go beyond the law. That is the question. So this 1215 AD, this norm was again developed by Sir Edward Pope, the Chief Justice during the period of King James. He was the originator of this rule of law concept, actually. So the King came and Edward Coke actually he evolved the concept or the idea of what we call as the rule of law. And he claimed that it should be under God and law, and law. That is the idea. King should be, he should be under God, um, uh, under God and he should be under law. So this is the important. Now, uh, if you see Aristotle, Aristotle, he would say that whether we need just law, or whether need, we need just man govern a state. This is the important question before us. Govern a state, whether we need the best man or whether we need the best law. And if there is a best law, everybody will be governed. And if there is a best man, of course, there can be a better governance. In which out of this, which one can be chosen? If we choose better a best law, if we choose a best legal system, 
this uh, what we call as rule of law uh, that is what we call as uh, uh, i mean want to be governed by the rule of law that's why but cook he says that uh, king he should be under god and he should be under the law so that's why so we can say that in this instant supremacy of supremacy the concept of supremacy is transcended from man law so which one is supreme whether the king the best man or which one is supreme whether the law the best law that supremacy of law or the concept of the law uh, uh, being given supremacy above the king is the idea given by Edward Cook. It is the important point. So this is the basic or the, this is the fundamental idea as far as rule of law is concerned. The basic thing as I have told you is whether the king is above the law or the law is above the king. So that's why uh, this concept evolved by Edward Pope in England was given much elaborated discussion by Professor A.V. D.C. or the concept of diversity given by uh, the rule of law given by the D.C. Perhaps uh, all of us, we may be knowing that about the concept of D.C. Regarding rule of law, D.C. has given three concepts or three characters regarding rule of law. One is supremacy of law and then Next one is equality before law. And the third one is predominance of uh, legal spring. Uh, these are the three ideas given by DC as far as uh, uh, the rule of law is concerned. One is supremacy of law. Second one is equality before law. And the third one is the predominance of legal spring. Now, the point is, according to DC, if a legal system contains the elements of supremacy of law. If a legal system contains the elements of equality before law, and if a legal system contains the elements of predominance of a legal spirit, then it is a better legal system. I have told you that uh, as far as Aristotle is concerned, whether we need a best man or we need a best legal system. And now we know that we need a best legal system. And if we need a best legal system, what about the best legal system? Or what about the uh, real aspect of how can we say, or when can we say the legal system is a best legal system? So according to DC, the legal system is a best legal system if it incorporates the concept of rule of law. This is the theory of DIC. So we need a best legal system. Then we say get a best legal system. We get a best legal system, a legal system that incorporates the concept of rule of law. So what is that concept of rule of law? So according to DIC, best legal system should have the idea of supremacy of law. The best legal system should have the idea of equality before law. And the best legal system should have predominance of a legal spirit. And just like that, suppose if we prepare some, we call us prepare a cup of coffee. And when we prepare a cup of coffee, then that cup of coffee, coffee can be a best coffee. Cup of coffee can be a best coffee if we mix milk. Uh, 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 I mean, a brew like that, uh, some quality, a uh, good quality coffee material, if you mix, it may become coffee. Otherwise, it may not be a good coffee. And just like that, if we mix rule of law in the legal system, it will become a best legal system. And if we do not mix rule of law in a legal system, maybe an ordinary coffee, it cannot be a best coffee. This is the important point. That's why. According to DICE, the best legal system should incorporate the elements of rule of law. And the important point is, DICE, actually, he was comparing the French legal system and he was comparing the British legal system. And according to DICE, so we know that according to Aristotle, we need a best legal system. According to DICE, legal system existing in England is the best legal system. 
whereas the legal system existing in France is not a best legal system. So we know that in France also there is a legal system. In England also there is a legal system. He says that the legal system existing in England is the best legal system. And the system existing in France is not the best legal system. So why? Why coffee, the one co cup of coffee is an ordinary coffee? And why another cup of coffee is a best coffee? The best coffee contains uh, the best uh, coffee powder or something. And just like that, Dicey was comparing. And Dicey, up, up class to Dicey says that as far as French legal system is concerned, even though in France are having a legal system, they do not have the element of rule of law. Whereas in England, they are having a legal system, and the legal system has got good quality coffee, it is the rule of law. Whereby the British legal system is the best legal system, like that Dicey was claiming. So, according to Lysi, Lysi, supremacy of law was absent in even though France has got a legal system, supremacy of law was absent in France, equality before law was absent in France, and the predominance of legal spirit was absent in France. So thereby, France has got a legal system, but it is not the best legal system. Whereas England, equality before law is there, supremacy of law is there, and the predominance of the legal spirit is there by it is the best legal system. This is the argument of IC. Perhaps uh, all, all of you, you, you come across all these areas and thereby I'm not discussing them in detail. But you know that according to IC, supremacy of law means, according to him, IC, absence of arbitrary power. We know that according to IC, supremacy of law means absence of arbitrary power absence of wide discretionary power. So we know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And thereby, so Dicey says that when we say supremacy of law, there must be absence of arbitrary power. And then he says that equality before law. And equality before law is the first concept regarding rule of law evolved by David Cook. So that he says that whether king or the scavenger, whoever may be, they are bound by the law, and the law is supreme, and thereby everybody is equal before the law. So when he says that law is supreme, and in the sense the king or the scavenger have to be brought before the law, like the first equality before law, actually the king, the state, or the individual are equal before the law. This is one concept, and Above that, when he says that the supremacy of law or law is supreme, he gives another idea. When, when can we say that law is supreme? Or at what point of time we can say that law is supreme? This is the idea of uh, Dicey. So law, according to Dicey, law is supreme when there is no scope for arbitrary exercise of power. And law is supreme when there is no scope for and authority exercise his power at his weakness and passions. Now, this juncture, even though I have not given in the PowerPoint, I shall I, I try to discuss with you about a constitutional law case. It is what we call as the Peri Karpan versus State of Tamil Nadu. Perhaps most of you may be knowing about Peri Karpan versus State of Tamil Nadu. This was a 1971 case. And in Piyakarpan versus State of Tamil Nadu, Piyakarpan, he was a pre-university student at that time. Piyakarpan was a pre-university student in the Madurai University in Tamil Nadu, Madurai Kamaraj University. At that time, it was called as Madurai University. Now, 19, before 1978, there was no question of higher secondary courts in Tamil Nadu. And there was PUC or pre-university courts. And after the university courts, students they can join in various professions. So Peri Karpan, he stood third, third rank in Madurai Kamaraj University. In the pre-university courts, in the sense, instead of higher secondary courts, that thing was pre-university courts. Peri Karpan was, he got the third rank in Madurai Kamaraj University. 
and then that thing was regarding what we call as uh, uh, MBBS admission or admissions to medical college. Now, for admissions to medical college, we are supposed to write a NEET examination and also a uh, 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 NEET examination. And prior to that, you know that uh, as far as uh, the medical admission is concerned, it is basing on the mark secured in the higher secondary examination. This it is based on totally wheat. That was the position regarding the admission for MBBS. In 1971, Tamil Nadu was divided into eight groups or eight divisions. Madurai Division, Trinalveli Division, Kanchur uh, Division, Kwambutra Division, Division, Chennai Division, Engalpattu Division. The two more divisions like that, Tamil Nadu was divided into eight divisions. Those students who passed in the university can apply for MBBS in any one of the divisions. Suppose a student who applied in Colonel Valley Division, he cannot apply in Madurai Division. Like that, in any one of the divisions, he can apply. Now, A. Karpan was uh, uh, also applied. Now, what happened was process of admission in the sense that thing the admission process was 100 marks to be allotted. In that 100 marks, the marks for qualifying uh, um, uh, qualifying marks obtained in the qualifying courts and 50 marks for the interview. So 100 marks for the admission, 50 marks for the interview, and 50 marks obtained in the qualifying examination of the qualifying courts. So pre-university is the was the qualifying courts and Periyakarpan. See, at the, on 1971, I was also a pre-university student. He secured 500 marks out of 1,000. He secured 800 and more than 850 marks out of 1,000. And Periyakarpan, he applied for MBBS. So if Periyakarpan secured 850 marks, the 50 marks of the qualifying examination means, and out of 50, some 40 marks or 40 points something he would do for the qualifying examination and remaining 50 marks for the interview and now the interview they marked marks in pencil not even by pen mark the marks by pencil and in the interview they asked what is your name from where are you coming why are you interested in mbbs like that a few questions were asked and for that marks were allotted so, qualifying examination at uh, 50 marks, remaining 50 marks just for three or four questions. And as you know that in that area, 50 marks, the interview or viva is under the discretion of the interviewing authorities they can give any sort of mark. And what happened was, Periya Karpan stood third in Madurai Kamaraj University not get admission for MBBS across the position. So that's why what I would like to say is now you know that uh, this is what we call as uh, arbitrary power. Even though the power is given by law, even though there is a legal system, legal system gives a loophole of arbitrary exercise of power. For 50 marks, four questions, you can give any marks. That means it is what we call as the arbitrary exercise power. So Dicey says that if there is a law and if that law gives room for, if that law gives space for such type of arbitrary exercise of power, there is no rule of law. There is no rule of law in a society or in a legal system, even though there is a legal system, in spite of having a legal system, the legal system itself gives room for it stands for arbitrary exercise of power. And there is no question of rule of law in a particular society. And that's why DC claims that in England there is supremacy of law. There is no question of arbitrary power is exercised by the state. But whereas in France there is no question of supremacy of law, the king can arbitrarily exercise his power. 
and thereby there is no question of rule of law in France. Of course, I do not enter into the discussion whether Dicey's analysis of France is correct or not. But my point is, according to Dicey, according to Dicey, he gave the theory called the supremacy of law, which is so important in every field of law, whether it is constitutional law or it is administrative law, or whatever it may be. Anyhow, this concept of Dicey called the supremacy of law it helped a lot in the evolution of administrative law. It helped a lot in the evolution, we can say that the growth of administrative law. So I have told you about the Periyakarpan versus state of Tamil Nadu. And now you think about the development after the Periyakarpan versus state of Tamil Nadu. So their system of arbitrary exercise of power regarding medical uh, admission it has been wiped out based on the concept of wiping out the arbitrary power. So the ranking system, merit system, everything has been worked out and thereby okay, now we can say that in the medical admission or in any admission, what is the question of arbitrary exercise power means has totally been minimized. And even in many of the decisions regarding IAS interview or civil service interview, High Court has directed that you cannot you fail mark the student. So in the interview, this minimum mark should be given. Like that, the, uh, in many of the areas, it gives its decision means it is based on the arbitrary, failing the arbitrary power. And just like that, you know about the Article 14 of the Constitution. And there in the Menaga Gandhi versus Union of India, Supreme Court itself, Indian Supreme Court itself, it observed that there is no question of arbitrary exercise of power in, in, as per the Indian Constitution. And the arbitrary exercise of power, it is antithesis to Article 14 of the Constitution. This is what we call as equality before law and the equal protection of laws. So this is the, of the main aspect of the dicey is what we call a supremacy of law and uh, is what we call as uh, absence of arbitrary power is many areas arbitrary power it is an area of vast discussion anyhow i i hope that by way of peri karpan versus state of tamil nadu and allotting 50 marks for interview by asking four questions uh, you could understand the concept of arbitrary exercise of power and that has been Totally with the concept of supremacy of law. It is uh, by the development of administrative law completely controlled in India. And just like that, you see, he talks about equality before law, whether the king or ordinary man, everybody should be brought within the purview of law. Everybody is subject to purview of law. Of course, you know that. Nowadays, I need not explain this in detail. And now, whether you study the tortious liability of the state or the contractual liability of the state or the functions of the state regarding the liberty of the individual and everybody everywhere we come across the, this particular concept and we know that uh, as far as this is concerned the state and the individual have to be treated equally before the law and as far as administrative law development is concerned as far as the tortious liability of the state is concerned, we know that previously sovereign function, non-sovereign function classification was there. Now sovereign function, non-sovereign function classification is not there. The state is liable to pay damages for its wrongful act. Like that many aspects we have studied. Anyhow, so far I have discussed equality before law, whether the state can also brought within the purview of law. And according to Dicey, England, state is also brought within the purview of law and so according to dicey in, in, in france it is not there and that's why in england since the state is brought within the purview of law the, i mean this uh, rule of law or in england like she was arguing and then i'm not discussing that in detail now we come across the last theory the dicey it is very very important as far as we are concerned is what we call as the predominance of the legal spirit. So according to DC, in, in, in the uh, British legal system, this uh, legal spirit is existing, 
that is a predominance of the legal spirit. That is what we say that. Something is influencing. We say that the spirit. We say that something it is influencing and it cannot be taken away from us. Now, uh, what I would like to say is, um, suppose if any person is influenced by evil spirit, what will happen? He will act according to the influence of the evil spirit. Now, Christians, they would say about Holy Spirit. And what would happen if I am influenced by Holy Spirit and I will act according to the holiness? If I act uh, evil, I am dominated by evil spirit, I will act according to the spirit of the evil. And if I am dominated by legal spirit, what I will do? This is the question. And Dicey says that all the people in England all the legal system in England is dominated by the legal spirit, which cannot be taken away from the people, or which cannot be separated or which cannot be departed from the people. So the people, they are dominated by the legal spirit. That, uh, that why the rule of law is existing in England. And what is that legal spirit according to Daisy? What is that predominance of legal spirit according to Daisy? is the important aspect now according to dicey when he talks about the predominance of legal spirit or when he talks about uh, the legal spirit existing in england uh, actually this distinguishes between the written constitution and the unwritten constitution or dicey distinguishes between the written law and the customary law and according to dicey Customary law is more uh, is superior than the written law because this he says that written law can be repealed, written law can be amended, whereas customary practice cannot be amended. It is deeply rooted in the minds of the people, whereby it cannot be amended, cannot be changed, and thereby in British system is completely dominated by customary practice. The British system, it is completely dominated by the common law and thereby the British system, the legal spirit is existing, it cannot be amended, it cannot be changed. Whereas in France, there is a written law. The written law can be amended, the written law can be changed and thereby only the legal spirit is existing in England. Thereby rule of law, it is existing in England. This is the area I am supposed to explain a little. Now, when you study the constitutional history of England, and when we study the constitutional history of evolution of parliamentary system in England, the uh, House of Commons and the House of Lords is the outcome of written law. It is the outcome of a uh, customary practice other than the Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha in India, which is the outcome of the Constitution of India. Now, Constitution of India, it is a written law. And since the Constitution of India, it is a written law, according to DC, this Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha can be, I mean, taken away, or they can be amended like that, anything can be done. Whereas, in England, since the House of Commons and the House of Lords are evolution to customary practice, it cannot be taken away. To be there as it is, as it was, and as it it will be. This is the idea of Dicey. So let's explain a little more. And now, see in England, actually, there was the king was there, and in order to advise the king, it was called a, a advised the king it was a body called the magnum Concilium, and the magnum Concilium would consist of members of the lords high, higher section of the people they were called as lords and the lords were there in the magnum Concilium, and the magnum Concilium it used to, to advise the king the lords were there but there was a king called king george and the king george he did not like lords in the Magnum Concilium. And thereby, what King George did was, he tried to accommodate the common people 
or the section of the society called the barons in the Magram council. So he accommodated or he accommodated some members called the barons in the Magram council. Barons means they are not lords. In the uh, British system, barons, they were inferior to the House of Lords. Are not the House of Lords, barons were inferior to lords. And the lords were in the Magnum Concilium. Now, barons were also accommodated in the Magnum Concilium. And in England, was, uh, the, 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 they, were, they were the meeting of the Magnum Concilium. The Magnum Concilium would meet in, the, in a particular place called the Westminster Palace. In the Westminster Palace, the king was uh, asking the lords and the barons participate in the particular meeting, Magnum Council meeting. So that's why lots came, they have the superior feeling, that's why they occupied their seats and they were sitting in the seat. The barons, they were having inferior feeling. They thought that even though we are the members of the Magnum Council, how can we sit along this uh, superior people, that is the lords. That's why the barons came to the meeting they were standing in the outside the Westminster Palace, in the veranda of the Westminster Palace. When the king arrived, the king could see that lots were sitting inside and the barons, they were standing outside. And the king invited the barons to sit along with the lots. The lots did not invite. But the barons, they were hesitating and they were standing outside the palace. So what the king did was, King called the okay, parents, you sit outside the palace, and lords, you sit inside the palace. Okay. As the Magnum Councilium consists of parents and the lords, they would discuss with the barons as well as the lords. So, so the king separately discussed the barons, separately discussed the lords, and he took their views. And now the barons were nicknamed by the lords as commons. In these quotes, the barons, the lords, they started to sit separately, which evolved as House of Commons and the House of Lords in England. This is the unwritten constitution of England. And if you see how British Parliament developed, British Parliamentary system, bicameral legislature, it developed by way of customary practice, by way of historical evolution. So that Dicey says that it cannot be destroyed. So what was evolved by way of the spirit of the people, the historical evolution would not be destroyed. Whereas a nation that has got a written constitution that can be destroyed, that can be repealed like that Dicey says. And also Dicey says that in England, the system of law available is what we call as common law. And the common law means it is the principles are developed by the judiciary. So in England, since the common law system is evolving, the principles are developed by the judiciary. It is not a written law. So I have told you the history of parliament. That is not a written law. Just like that, the system developed in England through common law it is not a written law. It is a law developed by the judges and thereby that law cannot be destroyed at all. That law cannot be taken away at all. And the common law system is developed by judiciary, and the judiciary is the most independent body, and the judiciary is the most superior body. It can even review, or it can even control the state, or review the decisions of the state, and the basic foundation for judicial review is evolved by Dicey in the area of what we call as the predominance of the legal spirit. So in the area of predominance of legal spirit, Dicey was discussing that there was an independent judiciary in England. Judiciary can review all the decisions or all the matters against the state also. And since it is independent the judiciary, since it can review decisions and since England has got an unwritten, unwritten law that is developed by 
common law or the customary practices where there is no provision to amend the common law there will not be any provision to repeal the common law whereas if there is any law any system is having a written law it can be taken away and now this is the that's why dicey says that this system of unwritten law uh, this system of customary uh, the common law system not existing in france uh, and thereby the british system is superior to the french system like dicey is explaining now uh, the time is going on and thereby in this context i shall discuss one case law and uh, thereby you will understand the concept and then i will i feel that i can uh, complete my uh, idea about this now the most important case about this is idm jabalpur versus sivakar sukla day of 1975 supreme court uh, i'm running fast you may be familiar with adm jabalpur versus sivakar sukla and article 352 of the constitution and article 359 of the constitution is very important in this area and now you just keep it in your mind that see we are having a written constitution you keep it in your mind that in india we are having a written constitution in the written constitution there is provision for proclamation of emergency under article 352 of the constitution and now and now article 359 says that in consequence of proclamation of emergency the fundamental rights in india can be suspended during that period that is the important point so article 352 proclamation of emergency and the article 359 is suspension of fundamental rights during the period of emergency now the point the thing is see uh, in 1975 emergency was proclaimed in india by late prime minister indira gandhi and uh, at that time um, late fagridin ahmed was the president of india so in consequence of proclamation of emergency under article 352 of the constitution president subsequently suspended fundamental rights under article 352 so the question is the during the period of emergency the indian subjects were having the fundamental rights or not 352 fundamental rights uh, emergency regulate 359 fundamental rights were suspended now uh, to know about the preventive detention legislations uh, and now at that time the preventive detention legislation existing in force was called as uh, what we call as isa it is the maintenance of um, maintenance of internal security act isa it was prevailing in india at that time maintenance of internal security act now now even so many dmk people were prefixed their names prefixed as uh, misa ganeshan or misa ganeshan or uh, um, misa mar like that many names were given so misa was a preventive detention legislation uh, it was there during the period of emergency now you know that if at all if any person is to be arrested under the preventive detention act preventive detention act now according to that particular act if behavior of that particular person is endangerous to the public order if the behavior of a particular person is endangerous to security of the state then he can be detained under the preventive detention act so it is to be dangerous to public order or it is to be dangerous to security of the state then only he can be detained under the what we call as uh, uh, detained under the maintenance of internal security act so the police or the administrative authority before detaining a person for detaining a person they have to apply their mind and they have to look into the behavior of a public person is endangerous to public order or the behavior of public person is endangerous to security of the state if it is endangerous to public order or security of the state he can be detained so without ascertaining whether 
behavior is endangerous to public order or security of the state, it cannot be detained. And this is what maintenance of internal security act, one of the provision. Now, you know that article 21 of the constitution, that no person shall be deprived of his life or liberty except according to procedure established by law. Except according to procedure established by law. And now, as far as preventive detention is concerned, some other safeguards are also given the Article 22 of the Constitution of India. If any person is detained under the preventive detention, immediately the grounds are to be informed to him. He must be given an opportunity for explanation. And all these things are there in Article 22 of the Constitution. And so, these are the uh, important points uh, as far as the MISA is concerned. So, MISA is an act relating to preventive detention. And since MISA is related to preventive detention, MISA is related to Article 22 of the Constitution of India because Article 22 talks about uh, protective measures regarding preventive detention and also the Article 22 is related with Article 21 of the Constitution with regard to liberty. These are the aspects that you have to keep it in mind. And so, Sivakanth Sukla, he was arrested by the police in Madhya Pradesh under MISA. And when he, Sivakanth Sukla was arrested uh, during the period of emergency under MISA, Sivakanth Sukla, he filed a writ of habeas corpus under Article 26 of the Constitution of India. Now, the argument of the state is, the argument of the state is, it is the period of emergency. And in emergency, Article 352, under Article 359 of the Constitution, the fundamental rights are suspended. When the fundamental rights are suspended under Article 359 of the Constitution, during the emergency, the Indian citizens or Indian subjects are left without the fundamental rights. So if they are left without the fundamental rights means they do not have the protection under Article 21 of the Constitution. It is they do not have the protection called the procedure established by law. They do not have the protection under Article 22 of the Constitution. It is the key taken by the state. Fundamental rights are suspended. No more fundamental rights. That means no protection under Article 21 or no protection under Article 22 of the Constitution. Hence, if any person is detained during the period of emergency, he cannot seek writ of habeas corpus. That means during the period of emergency, if anybody acts arbitrarily, if anybody arbitrary, acts arbitrarily, it cannot be questioned before the court of law. Not be questioned before the court. Of law. That is the question. And the argument of detaining or the argument of Sivakant Sukla is see, even though fundamental rights are suspended, even though the fundamental rights are suspended, still the state is to look into the state state is to look into there, my behavior is against public order. There, my behavior is against security of the state like that. The state is looking to. It is the duty of the state. And if the state fails at that time, the KBS corpus can be issued. Okay. What the state say? What the state says is fundamental rights are suspended. And then further, once fundamental rights are suspended, further no other right exists with the people of India as far as fundamental rights are concerned. Here we are coming to the concept of predominance of the legal spirit and the constitution. And IC says that in the area of predominance of the legal spirit, that every act is to be done according to law. If that act is not done according to law, the judiciary can review that is deeply rooted in the spirit of the people. It is deeply rooted in the British legal system because it has got an unwritten constitution which cannot be amended or which cannot be changed. 
in india we are having a constitution which is the supreme constitution we cannot go beyond the constitution so once fundamental rights are suspended or article 59 of the constitution indian people do not have fundamental rights do not have right to go for judicial review either under article 32 or 26 or whatever it may be questioning the fundamental rights that is the question so in this matter finally it was brought before the supreme court in adm jabalpur versus sivagant sukla this additional district magistrate jabalpur versus sivagant sukla and you know that under the twenty detention laws district magistrate is having the power to do thing now at a yeah, five bench decision it was first one was chief justice a n ray and justice bhagavathi justice bed justice sandrasut and justice kanna discussed this case and you know that this is uh, i mean four judges they gave the verdict in favor of the state stating that after the written constitution and something is done according to the constitution the no right is existing with the people whereas justice kanna only differentiated now i shall give the views of each justices chief justice a n gray he was telling that in india we are governed by a written constitution the written constitution is supreme we have to act only according to the constitution and thereby the suspension of fundamental rights is done legally suspension of fundamental rights is done only according to law and thereby uh, i mean further indian people are left without fundamental rights during the period of emergency and thereby they cannot go for a judicial review or they cannot go for any remedy like that chief justice a n gray he gave his decision and chief justice bhagavathi he gave the decision in such a way that see article fundamental rights are suspended once the fundamental rights are suspended you do not have fundamental rights how can you come to the court the fundamental rights are violated you know that when you go to the court you have to say that our right is infringed what he says that your right will be infringed only when you are having a right you don't have the right how can you say that your right is infringed this is the view given by justice bhagavathi and justice begg and justice sandrasud also lied in accordance with the chief justice a n ray and bhagavathi they observed that that is according to the constitution of india and thereby indian people do not have any right for fundamental rights or right for liberty or anything in the period of emergency it came justice kanna this kanna he gave the third view of the this is concept of rule of law this kanna he says that even in the absence of a written constitution even in the absence of i mean what we call as suspension of fundamental rights do authority who do not have any right to act arbitrarily or we have to bring the common law principle of predominance of the legal spirit or we have to bring in the ensign the concept of predominance of the legal spirit in indian constitution also and thereby even when fundamental rights are i am suspended authorities they cannot act according to their instant passions and because in, even in the minds of the indian people spirit is prevailing that for told their right is to be taken away right is to be taken away only in accordance with the law and the right is to be taken away only in accordance with the law not be limited by cannot be controlled by any written constitution It is something prevailing in the minds of the people now we say about the relationship suppose we say the relationship of a husband and wife is not a permanent relationship because there can be divorce but when we say the relationship of your mother and your son i cannot say that so and so is my ex mother i cannot say that so and so is my ex son and it is an inseparable relationship just like that predominance of the legal spirit not be controlled by a constitution in any system of the state 
loves legal i mean loves free to the the liberty or the lot loves freedom it must be freedom in terms of the legal spirit that anything should be what we call as uh, i mean their the right is to be protected and for the purpose of protecting their right there must be judicial review and the judicial review must always exist in the minds of the people like the dc and the justice kanna was giving the dissenting opinion and even though justice kanna gave his dissenting opinion and justice kanna was claimed as the very moral or very i mean moral he was acclaimed for his uh, uh, i mean uh, boldness or the courageous predict during the period of emergency and the west uh, opposition parties uh, just uh, recognized his uh, contribution to the judiciary stating that uh, when beyond the constitution the spirit of uh, being an act according to law based on dicey has been introduced by kanna in indian uh, uh, disputants thereby they fielded him as the president candidate in a particular election and this is a sandra chud he was a student in pune law college and after the emergency when this is sandra chud visited that particular pune law college all the students they threw chapels on him stating that you are the person who gave a decision against uh, what we call as uh, liberty a decision against the concept of rule of law like so this is the uh, important case adm jabalpur versus sivakant sukla that gave a momentum for dicey's concept of rule of law in england uh, in, in uh, england that was one in the indian scenario and thereby uh, the uh, we could understand uh, the uh, importance or the significance or the uh, role of law uh, so that's why so i i hope that uh, now you could understand uh, how the concept of role of law uh, is uh, given um, importance uh, in in each and every uh, constitution in the sense we need not it is not simply a constitution a constitution to be enshrined should have important principles should have the important uh, ideals and so now if we have a written constitution if it is to be a fair constitution it is to contain principles of supremacy of law it is to contain the principles of equality before law and that is to contain the principle of judicial review i can cite so many case laws also this area but the time is consuming perhaps you may be knowing about the sr bombay versus union of india in sr bombay versus union of india you may be knowing that state governments were dismissed by the central government or the union arbitrarily without following any principles it was being dismissed arbitrarily up to sr bombay case but in sr bombay who was the chief minister of karnataka questioned his its validity or questioned it uh, supreme court observed that uh, see to union you are not above the law and your act can be reviewed by the judiciary so they extended the concept of judicial review even dismissal of the state government by the union government it may go against the concept of federalism so these are the important areas how the judicial review of the concept of rule of law has been uh, used to uphold the uh, i mean so many uh, area uh, to uphold what we can as uh, injustice or that to uphold what i can exercise really arbitrary exercise of power by the state so thereafter we know that uh, puts the concept of rule of law in constitutional law itself we can find that in many areas of course in article 15 we can find concept of rule of law and uh, many areas we can find that and anyhow there is one scholar the name fuller is one scholar five name fuller f u l l e r one scholar uh, a fuller he uh, gives uh, rule of law as far as rule of law is concerned uh, he gives uh, three areas one is 
form of the law, substance of the law, and the procedural, uh, procedural law. So that is the rule of law regarding form, the rule of law regarding substance, and the rule of law regarding procedure. And there he says that rule of law regarding form means there must be certainty in law, there must be generality in law, there must be, I mean, accountability in law. These are all what he says that the rule of law regarding form. Rule of law regarding substance, he says that there must be right regarding certain important aspects. Say, there must be, we should have right on liberty. We should have right on freedom of speech and expression. We should have right on property. So all he says that the rule of law regarding substantive aspects. He says that as far as rule of law is concerned, the rule of law is pretty much related with what we call as the procedural aspect. So rule of law must be given more importance in procedural aspects rather than substantive or formative aspects. Now we know Article 21 of the Constitution, no one shall be deprived life or liberty except according to procedure established by law. Article 22 about is also the procedure regarding the pre preventive detention, even though they are the procedure, they are the fundamental rights. And these are the rule of law regarding the procedure. No one shall be deprived of his property with the authority of law. These are all the procedural aspects. So in the procedural aspects, when we come across uh, due process of law, that class is uh, uh, the procedure established by law has been given a, a clear interpretation in Menaga Gandhi case, what we call as the due process of law. The constituent assembly there was much discretion whether to put the class procedure established by law or the put the class due process of law. Procedure established by law is from Japan Constitution and due process of law is from the American Constitution. Anyhow, in procedure established by law, Constituent Assembly incorporated. But what is the meaning of procedure established by law? Controversy was existing in the Gobalan case and in Menga Gandhi case, gave procedure established by law means fair procedure, due procedure established by law. This is the idea also they evolved from the concept of fair law or the concept of concept of best law is the role of law. So procedure established by law. So now the present position is even though rule of law it is existing in various areas, rule of law it is very much related with the procedural aspect or the procedural law because that is to protect the rights of the people and the procedural law it ensures the judicial review. And basing on all these things in, in, the, in, in mind, 1959, this one international uh, um, uh, commission of jurists, they gave, uh, they, they made a committee convention in Delhi and they declared what is the modern context of rule of law. So in the modern context of rule of law, they elaborated how rule of law is related with the legislature or how the legislature the parliament while making the law is to incorporate ideals of rule of law in the particular law and the rule of law and the executive how executive authorities at the time of exercising their powers how to follow the rule of law especially judicial review this is a second aspect of the rule of law and the third aspect of rule of law is rule of law and criminal process they gave so many aspects that is the proportionality presumption of innocence and everything so i'm not explaining and at last they gave rule of law regarding judiciary and bar this is what they have given the rule of law regarding judiciary and bar they claimed that if a nation does not have an independent judiciary that nation will not have what we call as rule of law and also explained that they gave that if a nation does not have the fearless and bold advocates or fearless and bold lawyers, that nation will not have rule of law. This is the finally they have given. So rule of law, finally they have given rule of law of judiciary and bar. There must be bold and lawyers. There must be independent 
theory. In this sense, according to Dicey, is the third principle, even though rule of law it is there in the words or laid in written constitution, unless there is a, a mechanism to enforce that effectively, and then it is of no use. So there must be a, a system of judiciary, and even the law is to recognize the role of the law is in holding role of law. This is what is given in New Delhi Declaration. And now there are so many things are there. And finally, this one, uh, I mean, area that is Weld Justice Project. Weld Justice Project on role of law was started in 2006. This Weld Justice on role of law. And the Weld Justice Project, uh, it says, uh, when we say what is rule of law, the four elements are to be there as far as rule of law is concerned. Government and its official and the agents are something I am unable to read. And the laws are clear, precise, stable, and fair, including security of persons and property. Process which which the laws are enacted, administered, and enforced is accessible, efficient, and fair. Justice is delivered by competent, ethical, and independent representatives, neutrals, who are of sufficient number, have adequate resources, and reflect makeup of communities they serve. So, like that, they are giving an elaborate view or different views regarding rule of law. But if you deeply go into that, these are all the offshoots of Dicey's concept of rule of law. Especially the third concept, what we call as the predominance of the legal stream. And uh, as far as uh, uh, the World Justice Project is concerned, out of 139 states, India is standing in the 79th uh, position regarding holding rule of law. And uh, Pakistan is standing 130th position out of 139 countries regarding hold the rule of law. So, as already I told you, the rule of law is just like what we call as an ideal, a concept. It's not exactly as it is law. It's an ideal or a concept, but just like a quality brew powder, which can give you a best system of law. So, what can give you a best system of law? Best system of law we can find in supremacy of law, equality before law. And the predominance of legal spirit, and also if uh, the law is enshrined with the principles of rule of law, evolved by other scholars also say that we can have a best system of law. So this is a brief about uh, rule of law, and uh, I hope that uh, even though in online class you may have followed to an extent about the rule of law, and I thank each and everybody are patiently hearing me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you, you so much, sir, for your interesting and enthusiastic talk on the rule of law, the modern the modern concept of rule of law in the administrative jurisprudence. It is my immense privilege and my gratitude uh, to express my sincere uh, gratitude to you especially since uh, I know that you are not feeling well for the past three days. Even though when I'm calling uh, Ebenezer, sir, at 12.30 uh, uh, p.m. in the afternoon, uh, sir, voice was very dull. So I uh, thought that whether the event will be conducted or not, but sir promised me that at any cost, I will come and talk and deliver the lecture. Don't cancel the program. So this is... Uh, the uh, response given by my beloved professor, Dr. Ebenezer Joseph, sir. So I personally uh, express my sincere gratitude to you, sir. Now the floor is open for uh, the question and answer. A participant, please, in case if you are having any query, you can raise the query. So one professor, Dr. Felix, he has asked some doubt. No, sir. He has uh, posted the... Uh, it's feedback. a feedback form, sir. It's a feedback form, sir. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Any query? Any comments?
Anybody else? Dear participants, any feedback, any comment, any observation? Thank you, Mr. Prasad, sir. Thank you, Dr. Vishnu, sir. If anybody else is having any questions, please feel free to raise. I think uh, no questions. And now I request uh, Dr. M. Kumaran, the assistant professor, sorry, assistant librarian of uh, Tamil Nadu National University to propose the formal vote of thanks. So, over to you, sir. Yes, Professor. Thank you. <clears throat> Gratitude is one of the least articulate of the emotions, especially when it is deep. Good afternoon, everyone. Over here, cherished chief guest, honorable vice chancellor, madam, respected register of TNLU, faculty friends, and all the participants. It is an honor for me to have the opportunity to give you a vote of thanks on this third day of FDP. I, Dr. M. Kumaran, Aston Library, TNLU, on behalf of the faculty improvement program, TNLU extend a hearty vote of thanks to all delegates for their presence and contribution to make this FDP exemplary. I extend my thanks to our esteemed chief guest, Professor Dr. N. Ebenezer Joseph, to take out time to grace the event and the need of the hour topic of the modern concept of rule of law in administrative jurisprudence. On behalf of the FIP organizing committee, TNLU, on my own behalf, I thank you, Professor, for the inspiring converse and heartening us through your priceless inputs and the above topic during your energetic and fact-based presentation. Thank you, sir. A special thank thanks to our beloved Professor, Dr. Elizabeth, uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu National Law University for providing the massive support to make this program successful. I extend my hearty gratitude to Ms. K. R. Leela, the Register, TNLU, for her constant support for initiate such a fantastic program. I must not forget to thank the organizing team, faculties, and all the volunteers for working hard for the last couple of weeks to make this FTP a successful one. I congratulate all the participants for their active participation. Thank you, everyone, once again for making it a great success. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Ebenezer, sir. Okay, so please take care of your health, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Please take care of your health, sir. Okay, thank, thank you, you sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Thank you, sir. Dear participants, I request all the participants to join the session tomorrow sharply at 9.50 a.m. Thank you all. Thank you very much, participants. With your effective cooperation, we have successfully completed the uh, first three days. So please extend your cooperation for the next two days. Uh, already our uh, Thomas Felix uh, shared uh, the feedback form. So please fill without a fail. Thank you, Professor. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Felix, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Sir, I am not the host. I okay. Think. Okay, okay, FTP. okay. FTP is a host. We'll coordinate with them, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Nirmal, sir, please check up with our uh, resource person, sir. I think uh, yes, sir, Sar yes, sir. is in the session. I don't know whether Sar is finding any difficulty to leave. Let him leave, then we will close, sir. Please call, contact them and ask them to stop the recording, sir. I think yes, sir, uh, yes, sir. Professor. sir, please stop sharing, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now you could uh, leave the session, sir, professor. 
यस सर यस सर Yes, sir, yes, sir. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Have you contacted the IT section, sir? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, they will. So they ask us to leave, sir. So they will close the session. No, to check okay. it. Automatically, it will. Session yes, sir. Okay, sir. When, sir? Who is in charge for now, sir? Uh, Mr. Sendil or uh, Mr. Uh, Pradeep Jain, sir? Felix, sir? Sir, I Peter, sir. Contacting. Okay. Let them stop recording and end the session, sir. They will end the session, sir. Yes, sir. Let them end, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Felix, sir, and Nirmal, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.